This week, the president resurrected the grand bargain. Uh, you know, he has proposed that uh, that Democrats uh, and Republicans pursue a grand bargain uh, to cancel the sequestration uh, with a grand bargain deal. Uh, what's your take on it? Well, um, when you say this week, are you uh, looking at the news where he's looking down the road at July? Yeah, well, so let's, let's parse this out, okay? Um, as yep. you all well know, uh, the president came into office in 2009 talking about a grand bargain. Uh, it was a part of the, uh, the big debate about uh, the, uh, the debt ceiling several years ago. Uh, it has continued to be a specter uh, in the political arena, uh, and it's been resurrected again this week as a, a part of a concept of cancel the sequestration so that we can get a b grand bargain. And then on the, uh, the longer term, there's even a connection to the debt ceiling again. So let's talk about this in pieces. Okay. So uh, narrow first, and then I'd like to broaden out a bit. Okay. Um, narrow, uh, cancel the sequester is a bill, H.R. 900, that mm -hmm. simply cancels the sequester. What the president is looking for is cancel the sequester by implementing a grand bargain. Which you don't have to do. Which you don't have so to do. So let's talk about H.R. 900 first, and then let's back into why the president is not going the easy route. <laughs> Good question. Uh, so H.R. 900, uh, the House... The House Progressive Caucus put out a statement that said, let's have a one-sentence bill. We're in favor of cancel the sequester just by canceling it. But whatever Congress can, can do, Congress can undo. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of other AFL-CIO came out in favor of just cancel it. You don't mm -hmm. like the sequester, just cancel it. So there was a nice move within the House Progressive Caucus last week. And out of that came John Conyers, who did more than just make a statement, he did some action. Mm -hmm. He put out a one-sentence bill that says cancel the sequester. Mm -hmm. They've got 15 co-sponsors, they're going to be looking for more, they're going to get more, and that's the alternative to the president's grand bargain. So we actually have a bill before Congress that is an alternative to the grand bargain that really fixes the sequester. So if we could actually just cancel the sequester with a pen, uh, with a one-line bill out of Congress that the president could, si could sign, why is he trying to negotiate with Republicans to implement a grand bargain in exchange for the cancellation of the sequester? Well, to, to answer that question, and it is the question, uh, to answer that question, you have to go back to Bill Clinton and his attempt to cut the safety net uh, in 1990, um, something or other. It was just before uh, the uh, Monica Lewinsky scandal when he was working with Erskine Bowles and uh, Newt Gingrich to uh, improve, reduce uh, benefits under the safety net, and then the Lewinsky scandal came. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2006, Barack Obama, just several weeks into his new senatorship, gave a speech before the opening of the Hamilton Project in the presence of Robert Rubin and a bunch of other people like him, saying things like, we're all, free, we're all strong free traders here, and we, have to, we, we can't be wedded, my paraphrase, we can't be wedded to the social programs they, the way they were written in 1935. Mm -hmm. So what we're really looking at, and, and you've got to give it a name, there is a neoliberal agenda that has been operating in this country since um, Reagan took office and changed everything for the Democrats. So you've got to explain that, because neoliberalism has the word liberal, which sounds good, it sounds progressive, but why is neoliberalism dangerous? Neoliberalism is in America what new labor is in Britain. That doesn't mean anything to my listeners. Let's break <laughs> okay. that down. Okay. Neoliberalism is new liberalism. If you go back to the Democratic Leadership um, co uh, Council, uh, which Bill Clinton and Al Gore were, were founding members of, they decided that we could not be Democrats the way uh, Johnson and Franklin Roosevelt we're Democrats anymore. We'd have to be more corporate. We'd have to fight the corporate Democrat, the corporate Republicans on on their own grounds. And this is the beginning of the enslavement, you could say, or at least the servitude in some form of the Democratic Party to big money, which means that by now we have two parties captured by billionaires. It's just it couldn't be more obvious. Okay. The brand for that is neoliberalism because it confusingly has the name liberalism in it. But it's not at all liberal. If you look at these guys, they're they're um, Rockefeller Republicans. You know, they're not Goldwater Republicans, but they're they're fairly moderate Republicans doing billionaires' work. So it's an agenda of privatization. 
uh, privatization, but it looks different from the left and from the right. Uh, you don't have Medicare vouchers, for example. What you do is have the expansion of Medicare to all citizens, but you do it through a public-private partnership called the Affordable Care Act. Okay. So basically, the president and some other Democrats in Congress are neoliberalism. They, they are neoliberalists, if you will. They are actually embracing a big business, 1% of America agenda, uh, yet they have a perspective that uh, is only slightly different from the Republican perspective on this? Well, if you look at, at the, what's colloquially called the 1%, which is really the .001%, the people with mm-hmm. the really big money, they are different on the left and the right when it comes to things like gay rights and immigration. But they're not different when it comes to economic policies. They really, all of the, all of the big money in this country all wants the same thing. They want to keep wages low. They want to move manufacturing offshore. Mm-hmm. They want these strong free trade agreements that disempower governments and empower corporations, which they, at whose trough they drink. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's the same in both parties. We had a, an $8 billion ad campaign. And they want to attack entitlements. And they want to attack entitlements because, you know, you can less money for you guys, the more money for us. And, and at this point, we're kind of being ruled by a bunch of people that almost seem preternaturally driven to make money at the expense of absolutely everything in the world. So did Democratic voters or 2012 voters actually let the fox in the hen house when they reelected Barack Obama? I mean, there was no choice. Uh, well, I, I look at it a little bit differently. That's a fair statement. But, you know, in 1066, uh, King Harold of England wasn't attacked by William the Conqueror. He was attacked by the Norwegians as well. There were two armies in the field against him. He defeated the first one and lost to the second. In 2012, if you're looking at it from a true progressive standpoint, there were two armies in the field against us, the Romneys and the Obamas. We used the Obamas to defeat the Romneys. Mm -hmm. Now we have to deal with the Obamas. So when you say deal with the Obamas, what does that mean? We've got uh, President Obama actually proposing cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Uh, we, uh, the timing of this looks like it might even fall beyond the CR into the debt ceiling debacle. Could it be, uh, from your perspective, do you think uh, that we could see another debt ceiling debacle where, where the choice this time is uh, between uh, either letting the uh, U.S. Uh, default on its uh, full faith and credit versus uh, cutting Social Security Medicare? Well, I think that, that, that I, I'll say the man, meaning um, our president, but I, it's, it's not just some people in the party. It's actually the leadership of the party throughout. I know there's a lot of good Democrats in office. That's right. And a lot of good Democrats in the, in the country. But if you look at uh, the leadership of the, uh, of the House, for example, on the Democratic side, it's all new Dems. It's, it's just basically new Democrats. Well, how Democrats. is that? Because Nancy Pelosi has been touted as a progressive. She has, but, you know, uh, during the debt ceiling, she kind of overplayed that hand and, and said that, in essence, whatever deal Barack Obama and um, uh, Boehner come up with, Hoyer and I will quit for it. Well, okay. that's a blank to cut benefits. Well, we know that Hoyer has long held these views, but I think that Nancy Pelosi has been viewed as being progressive, and Clyburn has been viewed as being progressive. How, how is that? Uh, is he indeed a new Dem? Well, let's find out when they vote. I mean, at some point, we've... we've, we've I think we've, that there is a track record of votes that show that um, that there has been uh, an attempt to support uh, Simpson Bowl type, uh, Simpson yeah, Bowles type little, of... It's a little scary. And that's it, right. it really is going to come down to a vote. At some point, uh, Obama Boehner will come to the floor with benefit cuts, and it, it's, it's going to be, you know, you, you grab your courage in your hand and vote against the Democratic leadership, which will be whipping hard for it. I've been using the phrase uh, taking Dennis Kucinich's plane ride. Or uh, you're going to have to vote um, your, your progressive ideals, and it's not a matter of making statements anymore. And the ones who vote for benefit cuts are going to get a surprise in 2014. Well, so this is what kills me, right? Uh, because Democrats want to take back the House. So why support an agenda that uh, cuts entitlement programs, knowing that the American people, there's going to be a backlash? Well, I think that there's a little bit of, I think the Republicans are more clear in the House, are more clear that voting for benefit cuts can hurt them at the, at the, at the polls. 
than the Democrats are. I think they're they're kind of buying the cover story that if the you know if this candy that we're going to vote on has this nice tax cuts coating on it, we're somehow insulated. So let's talk but, about that. The Republicans then have been saving the American people from the repeal of New Deal and uh, and and Great Society programs. Blessings and praise upon you for saying that. Absolutely right. I'm, I'm in favor of whipping the Republicans who are resistant to Boehner and resistant to tax cuts to vote their conscience, which happens to be voting the way we want them to, and whipping the progressives to vote their, their ideals or their supposed ideals in a coalition that so far has sunk all of the attempts to cut benefits. We don't have benefit cuts yet. We don't have benefit cuts because Republicans have been resistant to going along with the uh, Obama grand bargain agenda. And 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 that has benefited upon them, too. Yeah. So this is interesting. So what's the what is the new way forward? What's the new direction? What and what does this mean for Democratic Party politics? Um, Well, the new way forward, I think, is is, has got a kind of a big umbrella idea and a and a and a and a win the battle idea. The big umbrella idea is that we've got to really see any Democrat who, by word or action, supports benefit cuts as a bad Democrat and rebrand them. Mm. Do not let them have cover story. And the purpose of that is to make it toxic for anybody to stick their head out of that hole and say cut benefits. Mm-hmm. That will whip votes on our side. Does that mean that we have an internal war in the Democratic Party between the progressive wing and the conservative wing? We already have that war. It's just that the other wing has been winning. All right. We've had that war for quite some time. It's like saying, uh, now do we have a class war? Well, we've always had a class war. It's just that the other side has convinced us not to fight back. Gaius Publius, uh, contributing editor at AmericanBlog.com. Thank you so much for your insight today. It's my pleasure, Maya. Thank you for having me. You are listening to Pivot Point with Maya Rockymore, brought to you by the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Stay with us after the break.